Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Reading Aloud Live. Today, I'm going to be reading Might is Right. There's a bunch of different editions of Might is Right. Uh, I decided to go with the very original version. Um, yeah. <laughs> instead of instead of trying to test out uh, people's copyright hold on, on different editions or um, what have you, I thought it would just be easier to read the original 1896 version. Uh, and so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to be reading Might is Right. Before I get into reading Might is Right, I do want to include the four words. Uh, the first one by Magus, uh, well, the late Anton Xander LeVay. And then the second one is going to be from Magus Peter H. Gilmore. So founder, former high priest, and current high priest. Uh, in the chat room, Behemoth, how you doing, man? Sarah? Thanks for joining and thanks for becoming a member. Uh, Valeria, it's good to see you, my dear. Kate, what up? How's it going, Kyle? Aaron, how are you, my dear? For anyone else who comes in uh, after the fact, these shows are really just live readings. And that's kind of it. Between each section, we'll stop, have a brief chat about what we just read. If any thoughts pop up for you, put them down in the chat and I'll share my own and we can have a bit of a back and forth about it. Uh, thanks, Draco. It's good to see you too, man. Thanks for joining us live. Ultimately, this is all about study, not worship, right? Like this is this is really what it's about. So for whatever reason, when the book Might is Right is brought up, people ascribe it to white supremacy, um, hate speech, to a lot of different things. And I'm a proponent of freedom of speech, which means sometimes you're going to read things or you're going to hear things that do not jive with your worldview. But that's okay, <laughs> because understanding how other people think is really important so that you can contemplate whether or not that's a worldview you would like to share or not. And if it's not, at least you're educated about that worldview. There are a lot of things in Midas Right that I'm going to disagree with. That doesn't mean that I think it should be a book that's burned or shunned, or banned. I think uh, every idea should be brought to the public stage, and as with any meritocracy, the cream will rise. <laughs> John, well, that's dirty. <laughs> Thanks for joining, man. Um, again, like I said, th this is going to be uh, the original 1896 version, and so it is ripe with... Uh, you know, punctuation errors and regular, um, you know, the, the, it's all scanned text. And so there's going to be errors in letter forms that are going to throw me off a little bit. I've never read this particular version before. And so it's going to be a little bit more challenging than, say, the Underworld Amusements authoritative edition. Um, so I would highly recommend that if you're ever going to purchase a copy of Might is Right, you go to Underworld Amusements and pick it up from them. They did a lot of work in cleaning it up, universalizing different editions, and bringing forth a fully annotated version of Might is Right, for those of you who care. Hello, Gary. How's it going? Uh, rationally cooked beans. <laughs> rationally cooked bacon. Uh, I dig the name, man. <laughs> Good, good. Well, I hope I can live up to your expectation. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this is the original. So there there have been a number of printed editions. Uh, anything else? Um, again, some of the ideas herein I'm going to uh, be copacetic with, and some I'm not. And so after each section, I am going to give you my opinions. They will probably differ from yours, and that's okay just like the text is going to be interpreted in many different ways by whomever is reading it, mixed with their preconceived notions of it. And that is unavoidable. That's what life is all about. And so what we're going to try to do is strip away our preconceived ideas and just read it for the bare text and maybe discern some bit of nuggets of wisdom if they lay therein. Who knows? Um, how's it going, Ashworth? Thanks for joining us, man. All right. So let's do this. I'm going to do the uh, very beginning intro, and then I'm going to dive into the forewords. So uh, let's do this, shall we? 
And this is the original scanned cover of the book. Like all books back then, cover art was pretty rare. Might is Right, or The Survival of the Fittest by Ragnar Redbeard, LLD. We must then speak of this subject also. And shall we write concerning things that are not to be told? And shall we publish things not to be divulged? And secrets not to be spoken aloud? Julian, the Emperor. The law, immutable, indestructible, eternal, not like those of today and yesterday, but made ere time began. Sophocles. Might is Right, or The Survival of the Fittest. New book by Ragnar Redbeard, LLD, U of C, 178 pages, cloth gilt, $1.50 paper, 50 cents post paid. This is no ordinary book. Undeniably, it is the most remarkable publication that has appeared in Christendom for 15 centuries. Its philosophy is that of a scientific Satan, a realistic antichrist. With, <laughs> again, this is, with, uh, Grim and pagan logic, it assails the first principles of moral codes, religions, politics, and law, affirming that modern civilization is a horrible, hypnotic seance, a continuation of the terrorism and gloom of the Dark Ages. It also marshals an overwhelming array of facts to prove that the man of today is a physical and mental dwindling, a coward, a weakling, and a slave. Upon biologic specimen principles, it attacks the golden rule, the Sermon on the Mount, the Jewish Decalogue, statute books, written constitutions, and representative institutions, affirming that they are all without higher sanction or authority than organized duplicity or armed power. Therefore, if man is ever to be free, these artificial and domineering thou shalt must be entirely swept aside. Dr. Redbeard contends that fitness to survive must be tested by the clash of armies, all other tests being fraudulent. Victors in war are naturally entitled to dominate, and the defeated, that is, the runaways who fear to die, are equally entitled to servitude. Throughout all organic life, the chief selective agency is combat, Women admire warriors above all other kinds of men. Communities of cowards and their descendants are rightfully plundered, taxed, enslaved. Right and wrong are decided not by the meek, but by the mighty, who consequently may write laws, creeds, constitutions, title deeds, and rewrite them at pleasure. Equality ideals are mere millenni illusions, for all life is strife, a combat to the death. As long as the struggle for existence is moralized or limited by governments and gods, the unfit and base, instead of being trampled down as nature intended, are stupidly permitted to set up imperial injunction seats and deal out death, bondage, and ruin to highest types. Thus, by demanding his credentials, Darwinism is fatal to the tyrant. It rings him round with menace and destruction. It hurls against him 10,000 trained rivals. It proclaims to all men, nothing is true. Nothing is sacred. All things are open to you. Blessed be the vanquishers. Address, Adolf Mueller, sole agent, 108 South Clark Street, Chicago, Illinois. So I'm going to start with the foreword by... As noted here, Dr. Anton Zander LeVay. Before I do that, what do you guys think about that? It's an interesting beginning to a book. It's really smashing in the face and letting you know as a reader where this is going to be going. <laughs> it's not sugarcoating it. How's it going, Zachary? Thanks for making it, man. Hey, Bill. Um, the doctor has a bit to say about this. <laughs> and of course, for those of you who have read the Satanic Bible, which I'm hoping is everyone watching this in, or in the chat room, 
um, you're going to recognize the, some of the content of Might is Right. No, he doesn't waste time, John, not at all. All right, so let's uh, dive into the forward, the first forward. Might is Right Forward by Anton Zander LeVay. I was walking down McAllister Street in San Francisco. As I passed McDonald's bookstore, I glanced into the window as bookstores have a way of distracting me. This was in 1957. McDonald's was one of those legendary musty bookstores with dirty windows and books crazily piled everywhere and an old proprietor who must have been around since the 1906 earthquake. Leaning against some other book in the window was a stark yellow paperback titled Might is Right. Other than the solid black lettering, the cover bore a black scimitar in one corner and a black glove in the other. Intrigued, I entered the store, and as usual, Old Man MacDonald was behind the counter. I asked to see the book. As he grunted to remove the book from the window, he commented that he had just placed it there that very morning, and I was the first one to ask about it. As I handled the book, it became apparent that it was fairly old, but in remarkably fine condition, considering the cheapness of the glued and stapled binding and pulp paper. The copyright date was 1910. The printer was W.J. Robbins & Company, LTD, in London, and the author was one Ragnar Redbeard, LLD, of the University of C., an obvious pseudonym. I skiffled through a few pages, and my eyes became transfixed. What I saw should not have been in print. It was more than inflammatory. It was sheer blasphemy. Obviously, MacDonald hadn't even glanced within its pages, but I figured the odd cover and title would remove it from the window. As I turned the pages, more blasphemy met my eyes. Crazy as it was, I found myself charged at the words. People just didn't write that way. My mind made up, and knowing the place had a reputation for cheaply purchased discoveries, I said, I'll take it. How much? Mac lifted back the cover where he had lightly penciled 50 cents. The smallest bill I had was a single dollar, so I tendered it, and he counted out my change with professionalism befitting a $90 transaction. With my new artifact safely ensconced in a small, flat, tan paper bag, I abandoned my earlier plans and went straight home to delve into this outrageous tome. The rest is history. I began to include sentiments from the book into my vocabulary. I'd pass around the book to prove the reality of my words. Among my many writer friends, hacks like Robert Barber Johnson, Clark Ashton Smith, Fritz Lieber Jr., Anthony Bowsher, etc., none had ever seen the likes of Might is Right. Several years of this show-and-tell went by. Nothing. No hints of a clue as to who the author might have been, nor any recollection of anyone having seen or heard of the book before. I had found a Necronomicon. Naturally, every avenue was exhausted to track down the publisher to no avail. Then, after spreading the gospel of Might is Right for over a decade, came the official commission to write a satanic Bible. My agent and publisher wanted the material I had already printed in tract form, with additional stuff to make up the Bible as quickly as possible. I was not a writer. Some will say I am still not. But I had to draw from my inspirations what had to be said. Now, you must know that every single occult scholar I knew warned me against publishing the Enochian Calls, saying that nobody touched upon them and it meant doom to even mention them. Okay, that was enough for me. They went in. So it was with select passages from Might is Right, except I got no warnings because nobody had ever heard of the damned book, especially Head in the Clouds Occultniks. It had inspired me, though, and that was enough. The copyright, even with renewal, would have recently expired, so it suddenly became part of the Satanic Bible, with myself and my publisher holding, in context, new copyrights on the portions employed. A fractional content of Might is Right was edited for inclusion because the book is so filled with glaring contradictions that, at best, it is a rant. It was that very rant format, however, that had fired me up and, in many ways, spoke for me. It was my intention to synthesize inspirational yet eye-opening material, something I felt was long overdue. I intended the Satanic Bible itself to be an instructional rant, albeit a necessary and largely rational one. I felt that one could rant and still make sense. 
To simply reprint Might is Right would make for compelling reading, but to be ripped to shreds by liberal, self-styled rationalists. Not wishing to throw the baby out with the bathwater, I decided to immortalize a writer who had profoundly reached me. Clearly, Ragnar Redbeard was a man of erudition and conviction, though he may have often had a snootful, as we shall see. No attempt had been made to avoid credit to Ragnar Redbeard, like Jimmy Durante's Mrs. Calabash, whatever you are. Until several printings into the book, the dedication page announced to Ragnar Redbeard, whose might is right. But I question is, what took so long to discover and reprint might is right after the Satanic Bible had been out for years? The answer may be found in the word zeitgeist. The new Swedish translation of the Satanic Bible has restored the original dedication page, like Enochian to occultists, might is right has become a required treatise for right-wing treaters, uh, treaders of the left-hand path who accept the book with little or no reservation. There is so much brilliance there that the blind spots cannot do the whole in injustice. It is, despite my enthusiasm for the book, inaccurate to state that Might is Right was the inspiration for the Church of Satan. For the record, I was relatively young when I discovered it, but I had already indulged myself the experience of reading every scrap of anarchist, nihilist, extremist, and free-thought esoterica I could encounter. A day hardly passes that I don't read a comment from someone who is astounded at how close his own thoughts come to the message of my satanic Bible. My satanic worldview had been well established by past performance. I had devoured the works of Twain, London, Bran, Nietzsche, West, Hecht, Wood, Machiavelli, Finney, von Castiglione, <laughs> Castiglione and Shaw. I was impressed by Darwin, Spencer, Freud, Ingersoll, Gobineau, Le Bon, and Voltaire. And those were only the tip of the iceberg. If might is right can be said to have an inspiration for the Santa Bible, it was in this concise and brutal style and format. It reinforced what Voltaire had believed. The little pocket-sized tract was the most powerful weapon of revolution. It has recently been claimed that might is right was the inspiration for the Nazi movement, with due respect to Mr. Hitler, Satan rest his soul, I don't think he ever set eyes on Midas Right, but had done his own share of homework and thinking out of the premises for Mein Kampf. Again, diverse minds can think similar thoughts. It is unlikely anyone after 1930 would have known of, much less preached the gospel of Midas Right, had not the Satanic Bible brought it to light in 1969. I encouraged Church of Satan scholars in their quest for another printed copy of the book, even after I believed I had ascertained the true identity of its author. Book search services produced nothing. Then, one day in 1971, a COS member provided me with a photocopy of Midas Wright, which he had discovered in, of all places, the New York City Public Library. Now, at least a second copy had been discovered. My evidence indicates that Jack London wrote Midas Wright. If he didn't, he thought enough of it to transcribe it. As far back as 1964, I was shown works of the hard-living, hard-drinking author which had, like certain writings of Mark Twain, been withheld from publication because of their inflammatory nature. After all, was not Jack London a respected writer whose works were taught in every public school in a land which prided itself on its democratic ideals? My sources were Sibley Morrill and Virginia Harner. Mrs. Harner, mother of famed anthropologist Michael Harner and Mr. Morell, were members of the Magic Circle, the Order of the Trapezoid, which was to become the Church of Satan. Some of Jack London's unreleased writings were stored at the prestigious Bancroft Library, where Mrs. Harner worked as a longtime custodian and researcher. She was, at that time, a close friend of Sibley Morell, a researcher and writer in Esoterica without equal, Ghost towns, anarchist cults and communes, crystal skulls, kahuna magic, as well as pre-COS articles on myself. Mrs. Harner and Mr. Morell arranged to let me see the forbidden London material. Among stacks of manuscripts appeared entire sections of Might is Right in London's own hand. Elated as I was, I was not surprised knowing what I did of Jack London. If London didn't author what I saw, he liked it so much he made his own copy. I didn't want to whitewash London Redbeard. He was a wild man. 
Too often fans want to keep their heroes pristine, especially where satanic connections inconveniently surface. It has happened with many, from Benjamin Franklin to Mark Twain to Jane Mansfield. One of the most flagrant sugar coatings is contained in a biography of Robert E. Howard, in which the author of a chapter on the satanic poetry of Howard opines that those verses, to me the most powerful writing of his entire output, were scribbled for shock value and couldn't have been taken seriously. Mr. Howard, at worst, had just gotten up on the wrong side of the bed when he wrote his most stirring and powerful litanies. It would be understandable that a broadside like Might is Right would not even see actual publication in the U.S. Many, many prominent authors, for various reasons, have had to see their work first published in foreign editions, and in some cases, a language in which they were never written. B. Traven, a world's champion and mystery man-writer, the ghost ship, the treasure of Sierra Madre, used a long list of aliases, and even in personal dealings, never tumbled as to who he was. I know because I met him in Mexico shortly before his death. Everyone who knew him and his young girlfriend indulged him, his eccentricity, and their privacy. Much of Traven's output was originally published in German, even at times when he was living in Chicago. He was a haunted-looking man with a twinkle in his eye, probably from maintaining his charade most of his life. He even spoke of himself in the third person as Mr. Traven's agent. Yet he told me that he had been a Satanist since he was born, and like a shark, he never slept. To venture that Jack London was not only capable of might is right, but predisposed, one must understand that the man was rather complex. He was a werewolf. Yeah, you read right. His preoccupation with wolves and his related after-hours activities made him as close to a true lycanthrope as could be believable. The stone ruins of his burned-out wolf house and Northern California's Valley of the Moon still show evidence of cells wherein selected guests would be reputedly ring-bolted to walls for treatment by bullwhip. His grave is a few heavily wooden steps away under a large boulder situated to be exposed to the light of the full moon. Though a socialist by admission, he was in a special category I would call a sadistic Darwinian socialist. In Might is Right, as Ragnar Redbeard, he had no need to couch his misanthropia in fiction, as he did when writing himself into The Sea Wolf. Why wouldn't Jack London have written Might is Right? His turn-of-the-century time frame, literary style, and personality profile would make him the most likely candidate. Why even look for someone of lesser qualification? In a previous contemporary edition, I read where Might is Right was most likely written by an Australian named Arthur Desmond. Sounds okay to me. I never heard of Mr. Desmond, but the editor of that edition must have had reason to give him credit. Maybe it was partly to diffuse an unmentioned and unconsulted guy who walked past an old bookstore at the right time, was mighty impressed, and placed Might is Right on the map. I trust this timely and unaltered edition will satisfy a needed completion of a bizarre but pioneering literary excursion. Anton Zander LeVay, October 1996. <laughs> well, Jack London. Perhaps not, but he mentioned Desmond, right? And we'll get to that in a second. Yeah, that edition was very skull and bones. Here's one thing that I always, it's, it's like so on the nose, it hurts. The um, 1902, I believe, uh, edition that the doctor was speaking to, was just yellow cover with scimitars on the top and bottom, I think. Uh, the other printings had like knights on horses uh, or um, like Underworld Amusements has a bunch of weapons all surrounding it bunch of medieval weapons. I mean, this was written in the 19th century. <laughs> you know? There weren't many halberds and scimitars swinging around in that time. So really, this was a glorification of not only a time gone by, but a desire to bring back those times that most men glorify more than actually reflecting accurately. And this is an idea that I've, I've put out there on, on virtually 
every bit of uh, historical reference that I've ever done on any of my shows. And that is that we reflect on history different than it actually was living in that time. We like to encapsulate entire centuries in some cases to single ideas rather than the complexities. And honestly, when men often reflect on Viking eras and medieval times, you know, they imagine themselves being that tough Viking surviving battle. And in all reality, they would probably just die from a cold. I don't know how mighty that is, but that's more realistic. <laughs> and yeah, John, we do. We love to uh, romanticize everything, not only history, but what it means to be a man. Might is right. This entire book is nothing but a romantic machismo fantasy. And as much as many people love pieces of it, we're going to get through the hole and we'll see where we land on the other side of it. You know, Alexander the Great died of a cold. <laughs> It's funny. You must admit, after listening to so many of your read-alongs, I automatically hear your voice in my head while reading our book club. <laughs> That's funny. A hive mind version of the sixth dimensional time altering. Oh, nice. All right. No, you're actually right, uh, Bill. And, and I'm not shaming anyone for imagining themselves being the Conan, the barbarian that never existed. Um, of course, we we want if we're going to be uh, 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 the hero of our own fantasy, then we want to be a powerful one, a strong one, a bold one. Of course. Um, so yeah, I'm not shaming anyone. And it, it, certainly, if if you're someone who finds themselves in this work, then awesome. That's great. I, you know, there's pieces of it that I definitely connect with, uh, just not the whole. And so I take pieces, <laughs> and I enjoy them. All right, let's do this next one. Got a little tea, help my throat. Okay, so this is read with permission by Magus Gilmore. Uh, no other part of this edition will be read. Ragnar Redbeard revealed Peter H. Gilmore. Many of my generation shared that first discovery of the vividly odd moniker, sounding like it could belong to a Viking cartoon character, in the dedication section that, for many years, graced the opening pages of Anton LaVey's The Satanic Bible, to Ragnar Redbeard, whose might is right. This was included amongst a roster of names, some familiar and others intriguingly obscure, the trail markers leading to Further explorations for those of us who resonated with Anton LaVey's diabolically self-deifying ideas. That book, so simple and elegant in graphic presentation, expressed in both earthly and almost at times wildly bombastic tones, in opposition to commonplace Christianity that immediately piqued my interest. As a young atheist, I had earlier realized that gods were fictions, a perspective gained through my passion for ancient art and architecture, which lead me to view the reigning deities for both past and present civilization as socially effective falsehoods for controlling the masses. I had never accepted the Roman Catholic, which uh, Roman Catholicism, which in my childhood had been touted to me as the truth. My understanding of similar older gods and their religions, come and gone, had served as my inoculation against faith. I was thus ready for an alternative, and the very opening of the Book of Satan, with its miming of texts found in the Christian scriptures, cast with mightily blasphemous dynamism, served as a litmus test I was delighted to take. Did these powerful words thrill? Send a chill up your spine with their candor and fiery imagery? Or did they become the one step beyond which one wouldn't tread, for fear of what other decidal verbiage might be on hand to shatter the current dominion of the meek creed of the Nazarene. Like most reading here, I was one of those joyfully inspired. I'd had enough of what was widely sold as good, so evil beckoned, and I swiftly pursued its temptations. And of course, I wanted to know from whence LaVey's ideas might have found fuel. Before the internet became the ubiquitous source for gathering data, we 
interpreted researchers, uh, intrepid researchers made the pilgrimage to local libraries and uncovered via indices what might be stored among the stacks and tomes, both hoary and forbidden, forgotten lore known only to those courageous enough to take on the laborious but rewarding quest, the search for knowledge. Yet that red beard volume remained elusive, and so my other regular haunts for acquiring knowledge came into play. Those treasure troves of old and new publications called bookstores. Being interested in free thought and libertarianism, I often visited Manhattan's Lazes, uh, Laces Fair Books, chock full of works by iconoclast thinkers, including Bakunin, Rothbard, Tusil, and Stirner, where finally I came upon the Lumpanics uh, edition of Might is Right. I purchased, then eagerly devoured this book, noting with surprise how LeVay had used some of the best texts within to craft his powerhouse opening section of the Satanic Bible and to enhance several following essays in the Book of Lucifer. However, as scholars note is a typical practice in the crafting of scriptural texts, I observed that LeVay had altered Redbeard's lines, for his goal was to promote a philosophy of radical individualism and Nietzschean per, uh, personal power. While this is clearly a primary impulse in Redbeard's original, his work is flawed, as it also expounds the contradictory aspects of racism, sexism, and anti-Semitism. Those elements were rejected by LeVay, being incongruent with his newly distilled philosophy called Satanism. Years later, after joining the Church of Satan and becoming an associate of Dr. LeVay, I learned how he had created the Satanic Bible, basing it upon the introductory series of essays regarding Satanism and instructions for effective psychodramatic rituals that early Church of Satan members received upon affiliating. Even with his expansion of those pieces and additional essays explaining the philosophy, that made for a slim book. It didn't yet have the sense of being like the Christian scriptures in making dramatic stentorian, uh, stentorian pronouncements. To beef up this first book, LeVay appropriated the Enochian keys, then exclusively available to sects of ceremonial magicians, and he satanized them positing that they were likely reined in from being too obviously diabolical when they were originally written by John Dee, advisor to Queen Elizabeth I. But that was not enough. Though he had turned Dee's sepia-tinted angelic visions into lurid hellscapes, he needed something more. Words which would inflame his readers' righteous anger against the creed of servility and self-abnegation. He wanted his revulsion, for those who torture and maim while claiming to love their victims to be as a nuclear detonation of rage. And so he turned to the inflammatory phrases of Redbeard, which had so excited him in his youth. As he'd long been an aficionado of Might is Right, which, like Dee's invocations, was also extremely obscure in the mid-sixties, so in homage he extracted passages wherein Redbeard parodied Christian scripture as they were perfect for the explosive curtain razor section the Book of Satan. They provided the sought-after sense of this book being a contrarian black gospel, particularly once the words were edited to be consistent with LeVay's individualist vision. During an evening's discussion at the Black House in San Francisco, LeVay handed me a copy of Redbeard's book, which he had purchased in 1957 at McDonald's Bookstore on McAllister Street in that city by the bay. It was published by W.J. Robbins and Company, LTD, in London, and bore a 1910 copyright date. I was honored that he invited me to examine his original, Might is Right, from which he received so much inspiration. He explained to me that what this book had meant to him and why he employed it. LeVay detailed his approach to employing these excerpts in an essay written in 1996 that was included in a couple of subsequently published Might is Right editions. A fractional content of Midas Right was edited for inclusion because the book is so filled with glaring contradictions that it is at best a rant. It was that very rant format, however, that had fired me up and in many ways spoke for me. I intended the Stanic Bible itself to be an instructional rant, albeit a necessary and largely rational one. I decided to immortalize a writer who had profoundly reached me, Anton Zandor LeVay. At that time, the authorship of Midas Right was not clear. LeVay himself thought Jack London may have written it under the vivid pseudonym, since much therein resonated with the zeitgeist projected by his stories, 
particularly embodied by his character of Wolf Larsen from The Sea Wolf, one of LeVay's favorites. In the above-mentioned essay, LeVay explains how he'd come to examine Jack London manuscripts in 1964, which contained chapters from Midas Wright copied out in his own handwriting. But LeVay also notes therein that if London was just a fellow admirer of that text, then that was fine with him. I do not know if anyone had subsequently examined the archived London papers to corroborate Doctor's findings. In LeVay's own words, My sources were Sibley Morell and Virginia Harner, members of the Magic Circle, the Order of the Trapezoid, which was to become the Church of Satan. Some of Jack London's unreleased writings were stored as the, at the prestigious Bancroft Library, where Mrs. Harner worked as a longtime custodian and researcher. She was at that time a close friend of Sibley Morell, a researcher and writer in Esoterica without equal. Mrs. Harner and Mr. Morell arranged to let me see the forbidden London material. Among stacks of, of manuscripts appeared entire sections of Midas Wright in London's own hand. Elated as I was, I was not surprised, knowing what I did of Jack London. If London didn't author what I saw, he liked it so much he made his own copy. Anton Zander LeVay. Now for us, the mystery has been solved, and we know from a preponderance of evidence that British-born Arthur Desmond and atheist, anarchistic, social Darwinist, poet, publisher, and politician was the man behind the mask. Several editions of his book appeared during his lifetime, and he made alterations in the text for them. Trevor Blake took on the scholarly task of examining all of these editions, line by line, and documenting the variations. Uh, you hold in your hand the authoritative version of this controversial text, which has served to inspire many who oppose the degrading collectivism of Christianity. As the values of the followers of the myth of Jesus have permeated our culture for over two millennia, it has always taken bravery to oppose what is widely accepted by the majority as being the true and divinely ordained perspective. Following Nietzsche and other adversarial thinkers with whom he was well versed, Desmond here spat in the eye of the mythical Jehovah, cheekily plucking him by the beard, and we can still enjoy that act of rebellion. Since such divergent literature is not abundant, we pragmatic readers examine the totality of the concepts in Midas Right, and even though it contains wildly incongruent aspects, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. LeVay focused the excerpts he took from Desmond's work to project its quintessence. The rejection of forced egalitarianism via submission and instead championing a prideful self-determinism. That is not a distortion of Redbeer's essential message, but it does reject elements of the work which contradict that premise by accepting collectivist thinking. LeVay did not intend for people who might examine the full text of Midas Right to do so uncritically, for certainly he didn't, as we witness from his own words. You are thus invited to take the journey yourself, to view with your own individualistic sensibilities how Desmond cast a vision of society which embraced the nature of the beast called man. Much of it is just as potent today as when it was penned for submission to herd values through repression of independence and freedom of thought is now regularly practiced by the entire gamut of our society from the, light, uh, right to the, from the left to the right wings. The current proliferation of self-appointed thought police using social media as their tribunal would have assured, assuredly warmed the cockles of the hearts of now-deceased Gestapo and NKVD agents, whose past strident demands for doctrinal purity are again de rigueur. Their cowardice for being unable to entertain, discuss, or debate opposing concepts is contemptible. Too many today can't bear being exposed to ideas which they don't endorse, which might make them feel bad. They consider being offended as a mortal wound to their fragile perceptions, and so they aggressively attempt to snuff out or silence anything which they don't agree. With social shaming and violence included in their methodology. But combating these ideological thugs who would control what you are allowed to think by limiting what you are permitted to read requires that one be of sterner metal. I have confidence that those who peruse these pages will do so, uh, will be doing so of their own free will, and will approach with open minds to challenge and be challenged by the words crafted by Desmond's incendiary intellect. Some will ignite your emotions as you share his outrage at the 
stultifying blanket that has still too long been smothering those who would prefer to guide their own destinies with pride and boldness. Others will bring consternation and questions as to why the ideas in this work are not fully consistent. Desmond at time castigates the society in which he lived by scapegoating racial and ethnic groups, and his views on female empowerment are deeply retrogressive, which I find taints his primary motivation to offer an antidote to what Nietzsche aptly identified as a slave morality. We Satanists have discovered that those born to be their own masters can come from any sex and background. They supersede their ancestors by refusing to be part of any sort of collective identity and stand as sovereign consciousnesses challenging the world. As did LeVay before us, we can take the best of what we find in this volume and let Desmond's electrifying words, those blas blaspheming the mythical shepherd messiah and the abject morality ascribed to him, energize our resistance to all who would demand that we grovel on our knees in the mud. Galvanized, we rise, unrestrained, soaring with Elan towards our goals, on paths we blaze by our own hands. Ever forward. Vegas, Peter H. Gilmore, Poughkeepsie, New York, December 2018. Woo! That's great! There are far too many babies throwing out, thrown out with the bathwater. Ironically, from uh, conservatives just as much as liberals. All right, what do we got in the chat room before I go on? Uh, that would be a lot of anti-vaxxers. <laughs> what are you guys talking about? Um, the origin of myth are usually born in the dirt. That's why Russell Crowe rubs his hands with the earth and gladiator. Nice. Humans were fucking around with clay and dirt and said, I made this. I'm made of this. Thanks, Gilmore's use of the English language at times gives Tolkien and Dickens run for the money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And to make matters worse, you would think I would have read it. Like I've, I read it when it first came out. Uh, you'd think I would have read it aloud before I now just read it aloud, but no, I didn't. <laughs> like the idiot I am, I just uh, ran with it. <clears throat> As I'm doing with everything else in this, so be prepared for me to stumble, and I hope you're okay with it. And if you're not, see ya. It's that simple. You don't have to be here. All right, let's move on here. I do love that point, though, and, and I, I just want to reiterate it one more time. I mean, I already did at the very beginning here. Just because you don't like something doesn't mean that it should not exist. Right? Good, bad, whatever. <clears throat> Editor's preface. This is no ordinary book. Nothing like it has ever been permitted to see the light since A.D. 300. Even the boldest writings of Lucretius, Aristotle... Sallust, Celsus, Agrippa, Tacitus, and Julian the Apostate have been mutilated or entirely suppressed by an all-too-triumphant statecraft. With the discovery of America and the enforced expansion that followed came a renaissance of the realisms and heroism of the past. Germany throttled theocratic despotism, Cromwell hacked a king's head off, and Bonaparte pumped shot and shells into the socialistic absolutism. During the Dark Ages, when the cross was supreme, all heroic ideals in book form were rooted out and the authors roasted alive amid the hurrahs of faith-frenzied mobs. But the deeds of Napoleon, Attila, and Cromwell were, in the end, an effective, if belated, substitute for the thoughts that had been so cleverly suppressed. How these men by their actions, spat upon golden rules and sermons on the mount. How they scorned the pitiful thou shalt nots that enslaved and emasculated the vulgar and the vile who dreamed themselves the holy and the pure. Then came the writhing thunderbolts of Gibbon, Darwin, Spencer, and now the hypnotic myth that centers around the execution of a Hebrew slave, 
stands bare before an astounded but semi-convalescent world as a vast political hoax, a lunatic attempt to turn the world upside down. Given tore the historical lie into fragments, Darwin proved man to be an evolved protozoan, subject to all the restriction, uh, restrictive pressure that the protozoa are subjected to. Spencer followed demonstrating the ordered majesty of natural law. In strict sequence, this volume supplements Darwin, Gibbon, Spencer, concentrating their principia into one scientific and logical assertive. Women will find much in this book for them to honestly consider. In these pages, the feminine is classified as a bewitching animal whose grandest occupation is to duplicate valorous sons. Altogether, the logic of power is a most remarkable contribution to the study of racial decay. Undoubtedly, it is bound to meet with the antagonism of university monkeries and the hatred of idolaters, yet it is destined to have a potent influence for weal or woe over the destiny of this and other nations. This book was completed in 1894, but the first idea of it took form several years earlier. Now, going throughout the press, it has been revised and condensed. It would have been brought out in 95, but that much time was wholly wasted in searching for a publisher. The average book publisher is a very conservative animal and not at all disposed to handle books that tend to disarrange pet popular delusions. Now that the philosophy of power is finally sent forth on its mission, an apology to readers is required for many typographical and other errors that have unfortunately crept into the text. In a new edition, now under consideration, these lapses are to be rectified. Meantime, intelligent critics, there are few, cannot possibly misunderstand the meaning. The author, who is a practical man of affairs, thinks and writes with a refreshing bluntness that is almost savage in its vigor. Through his inability to read German, he very deeply regrets that he cannot search thoroughly into the famous works of Friedrich Nietzsche, Felix Dahn, Alexander Till, Karl Gutzkau, Max Stirner, and other missionaries of what Huxley names the New Reformation. During 1896, however, a vague inkling of the great thoughts that were stirring Germany reached him through translations published by Macmillan and through bitterly antagonistic review articles but his principal inspiration has been derived from the worldwide experience of an active life, together with a reflective mind and an inherited thoroughness, uh, I'm sorry, thoroughgoing hatred of hypocrisy, humility, submissiveness, and all slave virtues. Douglas K. Handyside, MD, PhD. So we have now read four prefaces to the actual text itself stating how incendiary this content is. We are completely primed to be blown away by the honest, blasphemous boldness of this text. I hope it lives up to it. <laughs> Wouldn't that suck if it just continued as like a storybook? God sucks. <laughs> yeah. All right. Before we get into the actual text, which is now to follow. Oh, see, Zachary, I don't. I, especially if I'm going to be doing like a live reading like this, um, or I mean, just in general. I love the the prefaces and the forewords and the introductions and stuff because that again it's meant to prime you for the work sometimes it educates you about where it came from where these ideas sprouted um, their seed from um, whether or not it's an accurate version i mean i think all of that's important oh okay you read them after <laughs> i can already feel a tickle in my throat oh my gosh i'm going 50 minutes already Damn. All right. We'll do another hour and then I'm going to call it. I had no idea it was taking this long. Uh, yeah. If, if you guys can't hang, I don't blame you. So please, you don't have to. I don't expect it, but I do appreciate it. <laughs> so let's get in some incendiary language, shall we? <clears throat> Ooh. 
Introductory, Chapter 1. In this arid wilderness of steel and stone, I raise up my voice that you may hear. To the east and to the west I beckon. To the north and to the south I show a sign, proclaiming death to the weakling, wealth to the strong. Open your eyes that you may hear, O men of mildewed minds, and listen to me, ye laborious millions. For I stand forth to challenge the wisdom of the world, to interrogate the laws of man and of God. I request reasons for your golden rule, and ask the why and wherefore of your ten commands. Before none of your printed idols do I bend in acquiescence, and he who saith thou shalt to me is my mortal foe. I demand proof over all things, and accept with reservations even that which is true. I dip my forefinger in the watery blood of your impotent mob redeemer, your divine democrat, your Hebrew madman, and write over his thorn-torn brow the true prince of evil, the king of the slaves. Death! I say death to every lie. No hoary falsehood shall be a truth to me. No cult or dogma shall encramp my pen. I break away from all conventions, alone, untrampled. I raise up, in stern invasion, the standard of strong. I gaze into the glassy eyes of your fearsome Jehovah and pluck him by the beard. I uplift a broad axe and split open his worm-eaten skull. Death! I say death to every lie! I blast out the ghastly contents of philosophic whited sepulchers and laugh with sardonic wrath. <laughs> death! I say death to every lie. Then, reaching up to the festering and varnished facades of your haughtiest moral dogmas, I write thereon in letters of blazing scorn, Lo and behold, all this is a fraud! Death! I say death to every lie! I deny all things! I question all things, and yet, and yet, gather around me, O ye death defiant, and the earth itself shall be thine to have and to hold. What is your civilization and progress, if its only outcome is hysteria and downgoing? What is government and law, if their ripened harvests are men without sap? What are religions and literatures, if their grandest productions are hordes of faithful slaves? What is evolution and culture, if their noxious blossoms are sterilized women? What is educated and enlightenment, if their Dead Sea fruit is a caitiff race with rottenness in its bones? Two. How is it that men of light and leading hardly ever call in question the manufactured moral codes under which they themselves are born and tamed, under which our once vigorous northern race is slowly and surely eating out its heart in peaceful inaction and laborious dry rot? Standard moral principles are arbitrarily assumed by their orthodox apologist to be a fixed and unalterable quantity, and that to doubt the divine righteousness of these principles is treason and sacrilege. When the greatest thinkers of a race are incapable or afraid to perform their manifest and logical function, it is scarcely to be wondered that average citizens are also somewhat unwilling to risk life, fortune, and sacred honor for the overthrow of popularized right and wrong concepts that they know from bitter personal experience are unworkable falsities. Although the average man feels in his heart that nearly all political and religious conventionalisms are dynamic deceits, yet how cautiously he avoids any open display of antagonism thereto. He is not the courage of his opinions. He is afraid to say openly what he thinks secretly. In other words, he is living in a state of subjectiveness, of vassalage. He allows his brain to be dominated and held in bondage by the brain of another. From his infancy, 
He has been deliberately subjected to a continuous external pressure, especially designed to coerce his understanding into strict accord with prearranged views of moral, political, or religious duty. He has not been permitted one moment of real mental liberty. He imbibed fraudulent conventionalisms with his mother's milk. He listens to the most hideous lies being glorified in his presence as sublime truths. He hears falsehoods sung in swelling chorus. He hears them sounded on bugles of silver and brass. He hears them intoned by congregations of the faithful amid peals of sacred music and the solemn roll of chanted prayer. Thus, his mind is sterilized by authority before it has had a chance to mature. Thus, youth is mentally, uh, mentally castrated that its natural vitality may be afterwards used up in the yoke of custom, which is the yoke of slavery. In the nursery, at school, and at college, plastic brain pulp is deliberately forced into the prearranged mold. Everything that a corrupt civilization can do is done to compress the growing intellect into unnatural challenge, uh, challenge, channels. Thus, the great mass of men who inhabit the world of today have no initiative, no originality, no independence of thought, but are mere sub subjective individualities who have never had the slightest voice in fashioning the ideals that they formally revere. Although the average man has taken no part in manufacturing moral codes and statute laws, yet how he obeys them with dog-like submissiveness. He's trained to obedience, like oxen are broken to the yoke of their masters. He's a born thrall, habituated from childhood to be governed by others. Chinese civilization deliberately distorts its children's feet by swathing them in bandages of silk and hoop iron. Christian civilizations crush and cramp the minds of its youth by means of false philosophies, artificial moral codes, and iconoclad, ironclad political creeds. Deleterious sub-theories of good and evil are systematically interjected into our national literatures, and gradually, without serious obstruction, they crystallize themselves into cast-iron formulas, infallible constitutions, will-o'-the-wisp, Evan evangels and other deadly epidemics. Modern leaders of thought are almost wholly wanting in originality and courage. Their wisdom is not foolishness, their remedies. I'm sorry. Their wisdom is foolishness, their remedies poison. They idiotically claim that they guide their destinies of nations whereas in reality they are but the flotsam and scum froth that glides smoothly down the dark stream of decadence. Thus all the people of the earth are helpless, seeing those that lead are blind. Mankind is a weary, a weary of its sham prophets, its demagogues and its statesmen. It crieth out for kings and heroes, it demands a nobility, a nobility that cannot be hired with money like slaves or beasts of burden. The world awaits the coming of mighty men of valor, great destroyers, destroyers of all that is vile, angels of death. We are sick unto nausea of the good Lord Jesus, terror stricken under the executive of priest, mob, and proconsul. We are tired to death of equality. Gods are to discount. Devils are in demand. <laughs> he would rule the coming age. Must be hard, cruel, and deliberately intrepid for softness of sails, not successful, the idols of the multitude. Those idols must be smashed into fragments, burnt into ashes, and that cannot be done by the gospel of love. Three. The living forces of evil 
are to be found in the living ideals of today. The commandments and laws and moral codes that we are called upon to reverence and obey are themselves the insidious engineering of decadence. It is moral principles that manufacture beggars. It is golden rules that glorify meekness. It is statute laws that make spaniels of men. A man may keep every one of the Ten Commandments and yet remain a fool all the days of his life. He may obey every written law of the land and yet be a caitiff and a slave. He may love Jesus, delight in the golden rule, and yet continue to the hour of his death a failure and dependent. Truly, the way to hell is by fulfilling the commandments of God. If the all-conquering race to which we belong is not to irretrievably dwindle into multitudinous nothingness, like the inferior herds it has outdistanced or enslaved, then it is essential that the Semitic spiderwebs so astutely woven for ages into the brains of our chiefs be remorselessly torn out by the very roots, even through the tearing out process, be both painful and bloody. If we would retain and defend our inherited manhood, we must not permit ourselves to be forever rocked to repose with the sweet lullabies of Eastern idealisms. Too long already we have been hypnotized by the occult charm of Hebrew utopianism. If we continue to obey the insidious spell that has been laid upon us, we will wake up some dread morning with the gates of hell, of hell upon earth, yawning wide open to close again upon us forever. The idea of hell is in some respects a truthful conception suggestive of actual fact. If we terrestrialize the location, there's nothing inharmonious about it. Many a race, many a tribe, and many a mighty empire have gone down into a grimly realistic Sheol. Is it not right and just that the vile, the base, and the degenerate, that is to say the slave nations of the earth, should be punished piteously? for their creeping cowardice? Is it not right that they should be, as it were, fried and toasted, should swim in pools of boiling blood, or dance sweltering, satanic glees, with blistered feet and straining eyeballs in the red-hot Saharas of gravel and sand? In actual operation, nature is cruel and merciless to men, as to all other beings, let a tribe of human animals live a rational life. Nature will smile upon them and their posterity. But let them attempt to organize an unnatural mode of existence, an equality elysium, and they will be punished even to the point of extermination. I gotta pause there, sorry. hoo All right, so... <laughs> this is structured very strangely, in my opinion. So I don't know whether I should be breaking, because it went from three to five here. There was no four. Um, I don't know if I should be breaking between each section. I don't know. What do you guys think? I might have to, just because it's tough for me to read. The ultimate prison. Oh, are you reading along? Now you're going to see every mistake you're going to know. <laughs> It's free online. It's copyright. I mean, all you have to do is search. But this is, again, this is not the 1902 version that the doctor had. This is the 1896. So there are slight variations. Yeah, I think I'm going to, Zachary. Thanks. <laughs> Gets angry when I'm reading. Makes you really pay attention to what he's saying. Uh, thanks, man. In all honesty, it's all made up. <laughs> My outrage and stuff. It's just dramatic reading. I'm just trying to have fun. The truth is that last section was wildly racist, and, <laughs> and I'm not okay with that at all. Um, I, I see individuals. I don't see groups. And so in the same way that I look at Satanists, not as a monolithic ideal, but as individual people, I look at Christians as individual people. Jews, Muslims, whatever. Every individual on this planet if they do something wrong, then I dislike them. If they do something good, I like them. 
and good and wrong are all interpreted within my own moral ethos that is only applicable to me. So I don't, I don't need to conform or have others conform to some ideal. Just meet them as they meet me. You know what I mean? That's how it is. <laughs> ich bin Auslander. All right, let's go on. Got him curled up for this. <laughs> Five. All ethics, politics, and philosophies are pure assumptions built upon assumptions. They rest on no sure basis. They are but shadowy castles in the air erected by daydreamers or by rogues upon nursery fables. It is time they were firmly planted upon an enduring foundation. This can never be accomplished until the racial mind has first been thoroughly cleansed and drastically disinfected of its depraved, alien, and demoralizing concepts of right and wrong. In no human brain can sufficient space be found for the relentless logic of hard fact until all pre-existent delusions have been finally annihilated. Half measures are of no avail. We must go down to the very roots and tear them out, even to the last fiber. We must be like nature, hard, cruel, relentless. Too long the dead hand has been permitted to sterilize living thought, too long right and wrong, good and evil have been inverted by false prophets. In the days that are at hand, neither creed nor code must be accepted upon authority, human, superhuman, or divine. Morality and conventionalisms are for subordinates, religions and constitutions, and all arbitrary principles. Every moral theorem must be deliberately put to the question. No moral dogma must be taken for granted. No standard of measurement deified. There is nothing inherently sacred about moral codes. Like the wooden idols of long ago, they are, made they are all the work of human hands. And what man has made, man can destroy. He that is slow to believe anything and everything is of great understanding. For belief in one false principle is the beginning of all unwisdom. The chief duty of every new age is to upraise new men to determine its liberties, to lead it towards material success, to rend, as it were, the rusty padlocks and chains of dead custom that always prevent healthy expansion. Theories and ideals and constitutions that may have meant life and hope and freedom for our ancestors may now mean destruction, slavery, and dishonor to us. As environments change, no human ideal standeth sure. Wherever, therefore, a lie has built unto itself a throne, let it be assailed without pity and without regret. For under the domination of a falsehood, no nation can permanently prosper. Let established sophisms be dethroned, rooted out, burnt, and destroyed, for they are a standing menace to all true nobility of thought and action. Whatever alleged truth is proven by results to be but an empty fiction, let it be unceremoniously flung into the outer darkness among the dead gods, dead empires, dead philosophies, and other useless lumber and wreckage. The most dangerous of all enthroned lies is the holy, the sanctified, the privileged lie, the lie that everybody believes to be a model truth. It is the fruitful mother of all other popular errors and delusions. It is hydra-headed. It has a thousand roots. It is a social cancer. The lie that is known to be a lie is half eradicated, but the lie that even intelligent persons regard as sacred fact, the lie that has been inc inculcated around a mother's knee, is more dangerous to the contend against than a creeping pestilence. Popular lies have ever been the most potent enemies of personal liberty. There is only one way to deal with them. Cut them out to the very core, just as cancers are. 
Exterminate them, root and branch, or they will surely eat us all up. We must annihilate them, or they will us. Half and half remedies are of no avail. However, when a lie has gone too far, when it has taken up its abode in the very tissues, bones, and brains of a people, then all remedies are useless. Even the lancet is no avail. Repentance of past misdeeds cannot save decadence from extermination. The fatal bolt is shot, and into the fiery furnace of wholesale slavery and oblivion they must go to be there righteously consumed. From their ashes, something new, something nobler, may possibly evolve, but even that is the merest optimistic supposition. In nature, the wages of sin is always death. Nature does not love the wrongdoer, but endeavors in every possible way to destroy him. Her curse is on the brow of the meek and lowly. Her blessing is on the very heart's blood of the strong and the brave. Only Jews and Christs and other degenerates think that rejuvenation can ever come through the law and prayer. All the tears of all the martyrs might just as well have never been shed. Six. Whatsoever a people believeth shall make it free, enslave it, or corrode its very marrow in strict accordance with natural order. Consequently, if a people place implicit faith in what philosophers teach them, they are liable to be duped. If many nations are so duped, their deception is a menace to the liberty of the world. Free men should never regulate their conduct by the suggestions or dicta of others, for when they do so, they are no longer free. No man ought to obey any contract, written or implied, except he himself has given his personal and formal adherence thereto, when in a state of mental maturity and unrestrained liberty. It is only slaves that are born into contracts, signed and sealed by their progenitors. The free man is born free, lives free, and dies free. He is, even though living in an artificial civilization, above all laws, all constitutions, all theories of right and wrong. He supports and defends them, of course, as long as they suit his own end, but if they don't, then he annihilates them by the easiest and most direct method. There is no obligation upon any man to passive obedience when his life, his liberty, and his property are threatened by footpad, assassin, or statesman. One of Columbus's lieutenants in the West Indies captured a Carib chief by means of a subtle, subtle stratagem. The chief was invited to a feast, and when there, persuaded with honeyed words to don on horseback a set of brightly polished steel manacles, it being cunningly represented to him that the irons were the regalia of sovereignty, he foolishly believed as astute flatterer, and when the chains were firmly clasped around his limbs, he was led away to die of vermin, turning a mill in a Spanish dungeon. What those glittering manacles were to the Indian chieftain, Constitutions, laws, moral codes, and Hebrew-dominated civilizations are to the nations of the earth. Indeed, under the name of progress and social evolution, mankind has been lured into fated dungeons where its labor is unceasingly and for naught in darkness, despair, and shame. Like that Spanish lieutenant, the masters of the earth first flatter their dupes, in order to more easily enchain them, who talks nowadays of the sovereign people without a laugh of derision. And yet it was once thought to be a term full of significance. Their sovereignty is now an acknowledged sham, and their freedom a dream. The sovereign people be. It is clear, therefore, that the man or nation that would retain liberty, or be really safe, must accept no formula as final, must trust in nothing, written or unwritten, 
living or dead, must believe neither in spectral Jehovah's nor weeping saviors, neither in raging devils nor in devilish philosophies, neither in ghosts nor in idols, nor in laws, nor in woman, nor in man. Oh, threats of hell and hopes of paradise. One thing at least is certain, this life flies. One thing is certain and all the rest is lies. The flower that once has bloomed forever dies. All right, that was six. Whoa! See, this, this is far too tiny for me to read. <laughs> This chat room stuff. After I'm looking at these huge letters on the screen. Uh, what's up, Kevin? Thanks for joining us, man. Oh, cool. All right. Uh, if you guys are not reading the live chat, we're getting a bit of uh, live annotation, which is kind of cool. All right. Let's do a bit more, shall we? <clears throat> Seven. He who saith unto himself, I must believe, I must not question, is not a man, but a mere pusillanimous mental gelding. He who believes because it has been handed down is a menial in his heart. And he who believes because it has been written is a fool in his folly. Sagacious spirits doubt all things and hold fast only to that which is demonstrably true. The rules of life are not to be found in Korans, Bibles, Decalogues, and Constitutions, but rather the rules of decadence and death. The law of laws is not written in Hebrew consonants or upon tables of brass and stone, but in every man's own heart. He who obeys any standard of right and wrong, but the one set up by his own conscience, betrays himself into the hands of his enemies, who are ever lying in wait to bind him to their millstones. And generally, a man's most dangerous enemies are his neighbors. Masterful men laugh with contempt at spiritual thunders and have no occasion to dread the decisions of any human tribunal. They're above and beyond all that. Laws and regulations are only for conquered vassals. The free man does not require them. He may manufacture and post up Decalogue regulations to bind and control dependents with, but he does not himself bow down before these inventions of his own hands, except as a lure. Statute books and golden rules were made to fetter slaves and fools. Very useful they are for controlling the herd of sentenced convicts, who fill the factories and cultivate the fields. All moral principles, therefore, are the servitors, not the masters of the strong. Power made moral codes, and power abrogates them. A man is under no obligation to obey anything or anybody. It is only serving men that must obey, because they are caitiffs by birth, breeding, and condition. Morals are only required in an immoral community, that is to say, a community held in a state of conquest. Fear God, bridle the spirit, and obey the law is advice for most excellent uh, is advice most excellent as from a philosopher to a yokel. But when directed in all earnestness at a man of inherent might, he smiles to himself in silent scorn. Full well he knows that in actual life the path to victory and renown does not lie through the Gethsemanes, but over fallen enemies, the ruins of rival combines through Akeldamas. <laughs> Meekness of spirit is regarded by him as a convenient sup uh, super superstition, very useful for regulating the lives of his servants, his women, and his children, but otherwise inoperative. I rest my hopes on nothing, proclaimed Goethe, and masterful minds in all ages have never done otherwise. 
This unspoken thought gives to all truly great men their manifest superiority over the brainless, vociferating herd. The common people have always had to be befooled with some written or wooden or golden idol, some constitution, declaration, or gospel. Consequently, the majority of them have ever been mental thralls living and dying in an atmosphere of strong illusion. They are befooled and hypnotized even to this hour, and a large proportion of them must remain so until time is no more. Indeed, the masses of mankind are but the sentiment from which all the more valuable elements have been long ago distilled. They are totally incapable of real freedom, and if it was granted to them, they would straight away vote themselves a master or a thousand masters within 24 hours. Mastership is right. Mastership is natural. natural. Mastership is eternal. But only for those who cannot overthrow it and trample it beneath their hoofs. It is not a fact that in actual life the ballot box votes of ten million subjective personalities are as thistle down in the balance when weighed against the far-seeing thought and material prowess of, say, ten strong silent men. Stop there for just a second. My eyes are going cross. Oh my goodness. That last reading, uh, seven, I started thinking of uh, The Matrix. <laughs> I couldn't help it. He was talking about people who knew that they were living a lie and would rather live the lie than break free. And I just thought, yeah, that's, uh, that's the Matrix. <laughs> huh. All right. Good stuff. Have a good one, Aaron. Thanks for joining. Uh, so, those of you know, uh, tomorrow, I think tomorrow, I'm going to make this a... Uh, podcast, an audio podcast. So it'll be released on my RSS feed. So if you don't have time to watch all of this live, or if you don't like um, watching YouTube for long form content, then you can always just download the podcast. Uh, it'll be sometime tomorrow. <laughs> Red pill or blue pill. That's all right. <laughs> all right. I got about a half an hour left in me. <clears throat> Let's see what we can do. Right. No, I agree with you, Zach. The first one. <laughs> In my head canon, that's the only one that exists. <clears throat> we'll have to see about the remake that's coming out. Or the additional one that's coming out. Eight. It is notorious, universally so, that the blackest falsehoods are ever decked out in the most brilliant and gorgeous regalia. Clearly, therefore, it is the brave man's duty to regard all sacred things, all legal things, all constitutional things, all holy things, with more than usual suspicion. I deny and I affirm is the countersign of material freedom. I believe and I obey is the shibboleth of serfish. Belief is a flunky, a feminine. Doubt is a creator, a master. He who denies fundamentals is in triple armor clad. Indeed, he is invulnerable. On the other hand, it has been said that every belief, every philosophy has some truth in it, but so we might add his every insanity. Strong men are not deterred from pursuing their aim by anything. They go straight to the goal, and that goal is beauty, wealth, and material power. The mission of power is to control and exploit the powerless, for to be powerless is to be criminal. The world would indeed be a house of horrors if all men were good and all women padlocked. As far as human searchlights have yet penetrated in the darkness that enshrouds the origin of nations, we see the subduers and the subdued, the plebeians and the patricians, the chiefs, who governed, and the vassals who obeyed. And there is nothing in the most modern social developments of these deedless days to warrant any belief that this ancient and natural division of human animals into castes of superiors and inferiors, sovereigns and serfs, can ever be dispensed with. 
The slave owner's whip cracked from the beginning, and it will crack till the day of doom. In every kingdom, republic, and empire on earth, we have, in one disguise or another, the master and the slave, the ruler and the ruled. In the course of centuries, names alone have changed. Essentials remain the same. Forms of royalty may alter, but kings can never die. There was mastership at the beginning, and there will be mastership to the end. We build, but as our fathers built. Change is not progress, nor numbers advance. Everyone who would be free must show his power. Unalterable remains the basis of all earthly greatness. He who exalteth himself shall be exalted, and he who humbleth himself shall be righteously trodden beneath the hooves of the herd. The humble are only fit for dog's meat. Bravery includes every virtue, humility, every crime. He who is afraid to risk his life must never be permitted to win anything. Human rights and wrongs are not determined by justice, but by might. Disguise it as you may, the naked sword is still kingmaker and kingbreaker as of yore. All other theories are lies and lures. Therefore, if you would conquer wealth and honor, power and fame, you must be practical, grim, cool, and merciless. You must ride to success by preference over the necks of your foemen. Their defeat is your strength. Their downfall, your uplifting. Only the powerful can be free. And power is non-moral. Life is real. Life is earnest. And neither heaven nor hell its final goal. And love, and joy, and birth. And death and fate and strife shall be forever. This earth is a vast whirl of warring atoms. A veritable revolving cockpit. Each molecule, each animal, fights for its life. You must fight for yours or surrender. Look well to it, therefore, that your beaks and spurs... Your fangs and claws are as sharp as steel and as effective as science can make them. Though the survival of the strongest is the logic of events, yet personal cowardice is the great vice of our demoralized age. Cowardice is corroding the brain and blood of our race. The men have learnt to disguise this terrible infirmity beyond the canting whine of humanity and goodness. Words flow instead of blood, and terrible insults are exchanged instead of terrible blows. How rich this degenerate world is in small, petty-souled, good-for-nothings who are forever excusing their infantile ineptitude behind some plausible phrase, some conventional make-believe? Courage, I say! Courage, not goodness, is the great desideratum. Courage that requires neither tin whores, uh, horns, nor calcium lights, nor brass bands, nor shouting multitudes to call it into effective action. But courage that goes its way alone is undauntedly as when it marches to victory or death amid the men, uh, menacing stride of armed and bannered legions. Courage that delights in danger. Courage that knows not despair. Courage that profoundly, defiantly smiles on death. Courage that regards with equal loathing the multitude's mad howls of hate. Its stupid hee-haws and its stridulating tremendous applause. Courage that asks no quarter even with the knife at its throat. Courage that is stiff-necked, unyielding, sullen, pitiless. Courage that never falters, never retreats. Courage that looks down with supreme disdain upon all slave regulations, upon all rights and wrongs, upon all good and evil. Courage that has made up its mind to conquer or perish. That is the kind of courage this world lacks. 
That is the kind of courage that aids by active cooperation the survival of the fittest, the survival of the best. That is the kind of courage that has never turned a master's mill. That is the kind of courage that never will turn it. That is the kind of courage that will die rather than turn it. When Svitdag came to the enclosure, the gate of the burg was shut, for it was customary to ask leave to come in and see or take part in the war games. Svitdag did not take that trouble, but broke open the gates and rode into the yard. Queen Yisa said, This man will be welcome here. Ancient Norse Saga. All right, that was chapter one. Oh, mama. Wow. I'm going to have to look at this uh, live chat after the fact because this is a lot of great notes. Thanks for posting these up, Kevin. That's awesome. <laughs> Zachary. <laughs> that sounds like some 10 year old old trickery. Uh, so we've got. A Iconoclastic next, chapter two. Yeah, we still got some time. What do you guys think so far? Are there parts that you dislike? Do you like the bombastic nature of it? Is this something that you apply to your life or would like to? Clearly, if you're actively a part in a society, you're not living this <laughs> very well. Uh, unless... You're only active in parts that benefit you specifically, and then you just shun everything else, which is valid. Well, I'm glad you like it, man. It's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I love the bombastic nature of it, for sure. It is very much like uh, <laughs> old friends of mine uh, growing up where uh, I, I grew up and, and there's a bunch of uh, white supremacists uh, that were like friends of friends. And uh, this is the kind of dogma that they shared a lot. Though where um, in this text so far, race has only been directly mentioned a number of times, they would always fall back on race. Like always. And so everything, it had nothing to do with whether or not you um, were strong or weak, um, had the courage of your conviction or went with the, you know, flow. It was all about your ethnic background. Didn't matter where you were raised, <laughs> just your skin color. That's it. That's a pretty shallow way of looking at it, but that was my first introduction to this type of language. And so when I reflect on this bombastic diatribe, this uh, rant, uh, then I can't help but reflect on them and think of them. <clears throat> but like everything, take what you like, discard what you don't. Hell yeah. Absolutely. Well put. Uh, well put, Kevin. 14. Iconoclastic. Chapter 2. As far as sociology is concerned, we must either abandon our reason or abandon Christ. He is preeminently the prophet of unreason, the preacher of rabble rabbies. <laughs> rabble rabies. All that is enervating and destructive of manhood, he glorifies. All that is self-reliant and heroic, he denounces. Lazarus, the filthy and diseased vagrant, is his hero of heroes. And dives the sane, energetic citizeness, his awful example of baseness and criminality. He praises the humble and he curses the proud. He blesses the failures and damns the successful. All that is noble, he perverts 
All that is atrocious he upholds. He inverts all the natural instincts of mankind and urges us to live artificial lives. He commands the demonization, demonetization of virtues that aggrandize a people and advises his admirers to submit in quietness to every insult. Uh, contumely, indignity, to be slaves de facto. Indeed, there is scarce one thought in the whole of his dicta that is practically true. O Christ, O Christ, thou art fiend, thou great subverter. What an amazing eblis glamour thou hast cast over the world, thou mean and ins insignificant-minded Jew. Why is it that our modern philosophers are so mortally afraid to boldly challenge the inspired utopianism of this poor self-deluded Galilean mountaineer, this preacher of all eunuch virtues, of self-abasement, of passive suffering? The sickly humanitarian ethics so eloquently raid forth by Jesus Christ and his superstitious successors in ancient Judea and throughout the moribund Roman Empire are generally accepted in Anglo-Saxondom as the very elixir of immortal wisdom, the purest, wisest, grandest, most incontrovertible of all divine revelations or occult thaumaturgies. And yet, when closely examined, they are found to be neither divine, occult, reasonable, nor even honest, but composed almost exclusively of the stuff that nightmares are made of together with a strong dash of oriental legermain. Through a thousand different channels, current political economic belief is dominated by the base communistic Kabbalah of the man of many sorrows. Yet, as a practical theorem, it is hardly ever critically examined. Why is it that the suggested social solutions promulgated by Jesus Peter, Paul, James, and other Asiatic cataleptics are accepted so meekly by us upon trust. If these men were anything, they were crude socialist reformers with misshapen souls, preachers of a new heaven and a new earth. That is to say, demagogues, politicians of the slums, and out of the slums, nothing is that is noble can ever be born. As agitators, Jesus and his modern continuators shall be exclusively considered in these pages. However, it must be distinctly understood that the spiritual and temporal and all cosmogenies are so intricately interwoven that it is almost impossible to completely divorce them. Like the Siamese twins, gods and governments are inextricably bound together, so much so indeed that if you kill one, the other cannot live. Hence, the open or secret alliance that has always existed between the politician and the priest. Whatever their primitive purity or impurity, all operative creedal philosophies are essentially civil and military codes, police regulations. Religion is a power, a political engine, and if there was no god, I would have to invent one, says the great Napoleon. In letter and in spirit, Christianity is above all things a political theory, and a theory that often takes the form of raging hysterics. Religions are the matrix in which public institutions are generally molded. This has ever been well understood by the dominant leaders of mankind, from Numa to Brigham Young, from Solon to Loyola, from Constantine to the lowest Levitt hireling who gets paid in dimes and cents for his unctuous mock dithyrams. 2. All ye are brethren. Are all men really brethren? Negro and Indian? Blackfellow? Kalmuk and Cooley? <laughs> the well-born and the base-bred? The beer-soaked loafer and hero-hearted patriot? Belted chieftain and ignoble mechanic slave? Pot of iron and pot of clay? What proof is there that the brotherhood of man hypothesis is in accordance with nature? 
on what trustworthy biologic, historic, or other evidence does it rest? If it is natural, then rivalry, competition, and strife are unnatural. And it is proposed to prove in this book that strife, competition, rivalry, and the wholesale destruction of feeble types of men is not only natural, but highly necessary. Has brotherhood ever been tried upon the earth? Where? When? And with what final result? Is not self-assertion nobler, grander, and more truly heroic than self-denial? Is not self-abasement but another term for, in for voluntary vassalage, voluntary burden-bearing? Christ might well and truthfully have said unto his followers, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heaven, uh, heavy leaden, and I will bind you in unbreakable bounds and load you down like an ass between two burdens. <laughs> the poor and ignorant were his first followers. The vagrants, the disinherited, shiftless classes. And to this very day, the poorer and more ignorant men and women are, the more eager are they to follow his religious ideals or the political millennialisms, millennialisms that are distilled out of his delusions. If we only lived as Christ lived, what a beautiful world this would be, saith all thoughtless ones. If we lived as Christ lived, there would be none of us left to live. He begat no children. He labored not for his bread. He possessed neither house nor home. He merely talked. Consequently, he must have existed on charity or have stolen bread if we all lived like Christ. Would there have been anyone left to labor, to be begged from, to be stolen from, if we all lived like Christ? Is thus a self-evident absurdity. <laughs> no wonder that it is recorded, not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God chose the foolish things of the world, and God chose the weak things of the world, and the things that are despised. Uh, those terms are used in the strict Darwinian sense. Nothing else would have anything to do with him. Christ was indeed the prophet of the credulous rabble during three years of active agitation, and it's ab abandoned him in his hour of need. What always happens under similar circumstances, for the rabble is ever cowardly, ungenerous, suspicious, unfathomably base. It has never yet had a leader of commanding ability, either in peace or in war, that it did not ultimately desert or betray, i.e., if he did not take the precaution to make himself its master. After permitting Christ to be butchered, the mob thereupon set him up as their divinity and erected altars to his renown. Slaves, women, madmen, lepers, Magdalenes were the earliest Christians. And to this hour, women, children, slaves, and lunatics are the raw material of the Christian church. Primitive Christianity cunningly appealed to the imagination of a world of superstitious slaves, eager for some mode of escape that meant not the giving and receiving of battle strokes. It organized them for the overthrow of heroic principles and substituted for a genuine nobility based on battle selection, a crafty theocracy founded upon priestcraft, hellcraft, almsgiving, polis, politicalisms, and all that is impure and subterranean. It is a doctrine at once disgraceful in its anic antecedent, at antecedent, antecedents, its teachers, and in itself. Truly has it been called the fatal dower of Constantine, for it has suffocated, or is suffocated, the seeds of heroism. Both ancient and modern Christendom, and all that has its roots therein, is the negation of everything grand, noble, generous, heroic, and the glorification of everything feeble, atrocious, dishonorable, dastardly. The cross is now, and ever has been, an escution of shame. It represents a gallows 
and a Semite slave swinging thereon. For 2,000 years it has absolutely overturned human reason, overthrown common sense, infected the world with madness, submissiveness, and degeneracy. Truly, there is a way which seemeth right unto a people, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Sound the loud timbrel, o'er lands and o'er waves, the Israelite triumphs, the nations are graves. Wow, I gotta stop for a second. <clears throat> oh my gosh, you guys. All right, um, I need someone to be able to approve these. Zachary, I hope you're okay with this. Um, Thomas Moore, nice. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, what do you guys think so far? I personally, I am 100% okay with uh, shitting on Christians and Christianity and the idea of Jesus Christ because I think it's a bunch of bullshit myself. But, you know, what do you First of all, I, I got to address this in the chat room, Jordan, because if I had the power of turning water to wine, I too would be a wino. <laughs> I mean, how could you not? That would be awesome. Not to mention, most water was uh, filled with parasites and impurities because people would throw their dead in the streams and wash their filth in the streams and uh, throw their garbage out and, and their spoiled food in the streams so that it would just wash down the river to another village who then would drink it or bathe in it and spit in it and shit in it and then it would wash down the river to the next village. So water was actually terrible. Most people would drink beer or some fermented something, wine, beer, etc., mead, um, because it was the only pure food. Like, everything else was toxic. So, yeah, most people back then were winos or beer nuts. And in fact, there's... I don't know if it's true or not, but I, I would. Um, I actually watched a documentary on beer saved the world, or how beer, something like that. Um, and it said that slaves in Egypt were fed beer, not just as payment and as um, like rations, but also for medicine. Like there's natural antibiotics in the beer that they made back then which is not the same process that's made now. So don't get your, don't get your Miller High Life and think it's going to, you know, cure your COVID-19 because <laughs> it ain't going to do it. But good stuff anyway. All right. So I wish this was wine. <clears throat> Alas, it is not. Let's go for a little bit more. Three, is the golden rule a rational rule? Is it not rather a menial rule, a coward rule, a best policy rule? Why is it right for one man to do unto others as he would have others to do to him? And what is right? If others are unable to injure him or do good to him, why should he consider them at all? Why should he take any more notice of them than of so many worms? If they are endeavoring to injure him and able to do it, why should he refrain from returning the compliment? Should he not combat them? Does not that give them carte blanche to injure and destroy him? May it not be doing good to others to war against them to annihilate them? May it not also be good for them to war against others? Again, what is good? Is it reasonable to ask praying animals to do unto others as they would be done by? If they acted accordingly, would they? Could they survive? If some only accepted the golden rule as their guiding moral maxim, would they not become a prey to those who refuse to abide thereby? Upon what reasonable and abiding sanction does this rule rest? Has it ever been in actual operation among men? Can it ever be successfully practiced on earth or 
anywhere else. Did Jesus Christ practice it himself upon all occasions? Did his apostles, his sons of thunder, practice it? Did Peter, the boaster, do so when he denied him for fear of arrest at the campfire? Did Judas, the financier, when he sold him for net cash? Also, how many of his modern lip servants actually practice it in their daily business intercourse with each other? How many? These questions require no formal answering. They answer themselves in the asking. And here it must be remembered that the best test of a witness is cross-examination. Do unto others as you would have others do to you. No baser precept ever fell from the lips of a feeble Jew. It is from alleged moralisms of this sort and fabulous principles that our mob orators, our communards, revivalists, anarchists, red republicans, democrats, and other mob worshippers in general derive the infernal inspiration that they are perpetually hissing forth. Even the subversive, subversive pyrotechnic watchwords of their Mephisto millennium are to be found in the holy gospels. Is it not written, and God sendeth angels to destroy the people? Behold, these men are the angels that he sends, politicians and reformers. 4. Love one another, you say, is the supreme law. But what power made it so? Upon what rational authority does the gospel of love rest? Is it even possible to practice? And what would the result from its universal application to active affairs? Why should I not hate mine enemies and hunt them down like the wild beasts that they are? Again, I ask, why? If I love them, does that not place me at their mercy? Is it natural for enemies to do good unto each other? And what is good? Can the torn and bloody victim love the blood-splashed jaws that rend it limb from limb? Are we not all predatory animals by instinct? If humans ceased folly from preying upon each other, could they continue to exist? Love your enemies and do good to them that hate you and despitefully use you is the despicable philosophy of the spaniel that rolls upon its back when kicked. Obey it, O reader, and you and all your posterity to the tenth generation shall be irretrievably and literally damned. They shall be hewers of wood and carriers of water, degenerates, Gibeonites. But hate your enemies with the whole heart, and if a man smite you on one cheek, smash him down. Smite him hip and thigh, for self-preservation is the highest law. He who turns the other cheek is a cowardly dog, a Christian dog. Give blow for blow, scorn for scorn, doom for doom, with compound interest liberally added thereunto, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, eye fourfold, a hundredfold. Make yourself a terror to your adversary, and when he goeth his way, he will possess much additional wisdom to ruminate over. Thus shall you make yourself respected in all the walks of life, and your spirit, your immortal spirit, shall live, not in an intangible paradise, but in the brains and thews of your aggressive and unconquerable sons. After all, the true proof of manhood is a splendid progeny, and it is a scientific axiom that the timid animal transmits timidity to its descendants. If men lived like brothers and had no powerful enemies, neighbors to contend with and surpass, they would rapidly lose all their best qualities, like certain oceanic birds that lose the use of their wings because they do not have to fly from pursuing beasts of prey. If all men had treated each other with brotherly love since the beginning, what would have been the result now? If there had been no wars, no rivalry, no competition, no kingship, no slavery, no survival of the toughest, no racial extermination, truly, what a 
festering hell fenced in this old globe would be. I think that might be it. <laughs> Good place to end too. That was a that was a pretty powerful little bit. I dug that. It is very interesting, I think. Um the the pieces that the doctor cut out and how he altered them uh for the book of satan i think that's interesting because i'm like as i'm reading this i'm running across little bits i'm like oh i know that i know that oh yep there's that uh and there they yeah the whole time it's great but again not all of it you know i wonder if because this was virtually unknown to anyone at the time the standard bible was written um if there would have been any hubbub if he just placed the whole damn thing in there. I mean, we read the forward. We understand why he didn't. But, I don't know. Because let's be honest, we have all, in some way, met other Satanists who do very much see specifically eye to eye with a lot of this. You know, so... Uh, they out there. <laughs> They're worse. They're out there. Um, <laughs> yeah, dogs. Uh, it's hilarious to take random paragraphs from this, random paragraphs from Lorenz's Homo Non Sapiens book, shake them up, and read them in a sequence. Bro's cut up style, misanthropic fun. Huh. I'll have to look into that. <laughs> yeah carousel <laughs> damn dirty apes all right everyone that's gonna do it for today i think i'm, I'm kind of read out <laughs> that was a bunch we are um oh geez are we chapter three or chapter two i think we're chapter three section five i'll try to remember that okay let me write it down real quick three five and then we can just pick up next time, uh, just for the sake of everyone watching, so that you understand uh, the timing of these and such. I have a different reading aloud channel where I just read classic books. Um, between each entire book, I do one of these live shows uh, for this as part one. Um, so the next book I'm reading, after I'm finished, then I'll come back and do another two hour stint of this book part two of this so it could be a while it could be a number of weeks before i get back to it but my goal my plans are to get back to it and finish this in its entirety it looks like i'm almost a quarter of the way through it now so liberally we'll have a total of five parts to this probably um so you know expect that if you guys have any questions or comments uh, please put them in the description, I'm sorry, in the comments section of this video. If you want to get more of those annotations that uh, Magister Slaughter is sharing in the chat, go pick up Might is Right, the authoritative edition by Underworld Amusements. It is filled with wonderful information. And again, it is a comprehensive collection of all of the editions annotated, noted, and marked. Uh, so definitely go check it out. It's great. Thank you guys so much again. And until next time, Hail Satan. <laughs>